In this video, we will go over how to color grade your GH5 footage. What's up everybody, I'm Jake McHugh and this channel is all about making better videos. I do gear reviews and test videos to help you determine what gear you need to make the videos you want to achieve. If that's something that may interest you, consider hitting that subscribe button down below. In my last video, I compared footage from my GH5 using the natural and cine like D picture profile and in this video, I'm going to show you how I color grade that footage without using LUTs. As time goes on, I seem to be using LUTs less and less because I find I can get the look my Myself with having it be tailor-made to my footage. I just want to make a note that I am not a professional colorist by any stretch of the imagination, so don't take what I have to say for gold. There are many ways to do this. This is just how I do it. I will be doing this in Final Cut Pro, but the same method or rules will apply for most NLEs regardless. But enough talking, let's jump into our computers. Alrighty, so we are now in Final Cut Pro, which is my preferred video editor, but like I mentioned earlier, the same rules will apply to most other NLEs as well. As you can see here, I have two clips from my last video where I compared the Cine Lake D picture profile to the natural profile on the GH5. And I actually learned a lot about the two different profiles while making that video. So if you wanna see that video or check that out, make sure you check it up in the cards or down in the description below. The very first step to color grading is to find your hero shot or the best frame for each clip or a group of clips that have the same type of environment or lighting situation. As you can see here, these two clips are definitely different lighting situations, so I made a marker for my hero shots for each clip. Once you got the hero shots all picked out and out of the way, then we can start looking at our scopes. And I'm gonna get rid of this media browser here real quick to give my screen a little bit more room for the scopes. So to do that, I'm gonna hit Control Command one, and then I'm gonna hit Command seven to bring up the scopes here. And as you can see, we have our waveform right here. If you don't have this when you hit Command seven, just make sure you hit, hit this drop down menu here and go to waveform and luma. Now, the reason that we use scopes is that we can't trust our eyes or our monitors unless we have a really nice expensive one. So the scopes are a tool that we can use to actually see what the image is really doing when we make adjustments to it. The way that the waveform works is we have our IRE scale here on the left hand side and zero is where pure black or where the shadows would start clipping on the bottom half of an image and 100 is where pure white or an image would start clipping on the high end. A perfect example of the white being near 100, we have this white mailbox right here, and as you can see, it's actually clipping in the image, and that's up super high. If you look at his gray shirt or in the shadows right here, it's a little bit darker, and if you look at the values here on the left-hand side, the shadows are much lower compared to the white in the mailbox. The waveform mirrors or mimics exactly how the image is. So as you can see, we have some skin tone and some red hair right here, and if you look right here, it shows up in the same exact spot on the waveform. So whatever is on the left side of the image will be on the left side of the waveform, and whatever is on the right side of the image will be on the right side of the waveform. Now that we have a little bit of an idea of how the waveform works, we can use it to help expose our image. I always like to use color wheels, and I will pull them up by using Command-6. If you hit Command-6 and this doesn't pop up, you can go to this drop-down menu here and hit color wheels. Otherwise, if you're in this section here, just hit this little triangle, and that'll take you to the color section. So. What I like to do to start off is I always like to start with the shadows, so I will bring the shadows down a little bit here closer to zero. Not exactly on zero because we don't really necessarily have anything that is black in the image. And then once the shadows are where we like them, I will then move on to the highlights. And I typically like to have the highlights just under 100, maybe around 95. That way they're just a little bit protected and that way we don't have to worry about anything kind of clipping. One thing I like to do, and this is just a personal thing, is I like to play around with the midtones next and I like to typically pull them down a little bit as this adds a little contrast to the image. If you look right here, here is the original with no midtone adjustment. You can see it's a little bit flatter. Then when I bring that midtone down a little bit, you can see that there's a little bit more punchiness or contrast to the image. Once we have the exposure where we like it, we can make changes to the white balance if we feel like it is off. I will actually link to a video that I did a while back where I show how to adjust or fix your white balance without having white in your image. And this is a really handy tool or trick to know. So make sure you check that out and I'll have that up in the cards and down in the description below. For this image here, just by looking at it, I can tell that the white balance really isn't that off. And I also remember that I set it to a custom white balance using a card. So we are good here for white balance. Once we have the exposure and white balance out of the way, what I like to do then is start playing around with the saturation on the master wheel here. But what I like to open up first is the vector scope. So if we click on this drop menu again, Right above waveform, we have vector scope. 
and this is what I like to use when adjusting the saturation. How the vector scope works is that it shows how much saturation each color in your image has and if there is any color shift at all. If you use a color checker card, these boxes here on the vector scope are where you would want each color on the card to hit. Now, I personally don't have or use a color checker card, so what I like to do is I actually like to oversaturate the image where I know that it's too much, and then I like to bring it back until I think the image looks okay. And the reason I do this is that I know I'm getting away with as much saturation as I possibly can without having the colors look off. So right here, I think this is okay for starters. And if we look at our vector scope here, we don't have any colors flying off the page or going off to one of the sides here. So if we're not close to the boxes or we don't have any colors that are really out there, we are generally okay in my opinion. Next is to tweak the skin tones, and to do this, we need to use the flesh line right here on our vector scope. The flesh line is the hue on the vector scope that we want our skin tones to fall on or near. To make tweaks to the skin tones, I will first open up a hue saturation curve, and I will create a color mask to isolate our skin tones. I will take this picker right here for the HSL, and I will pick the hue of the skin tone, and if we click on view mask here, we can use the view mask tool to really help isolate the skin tones. So after using the HSL tools here, you can see that I really isolated the skin tones and the skin tones only. As you can see, I have a little bit of color in here in his hair yet, and we didn't fully get his nose here and some stuff going on in the neck, but that's really minuscule and it really won't affect our image too much. So once we have the color mask all set up, I'm actually gonna turn the view mask off for the color mask and I'm actually gonna put a draw mask on. I'm gonna type in draw down here on the bottom and I'm going to drag draw mask onto the clip. And then just by hitting command five again, it will close out the effect window. And what we'll do is we'll go back to this box here and I'm gonna actually create a draw mask around his face and isolate his skin tones once again using the draw mask. But I'm also gonna zoom in on the face a little bit here as well to make our life a little bit easier. And I can reposition this to get this right in the center. That way, we're really just focusing on the skin tones in his face. So after the draw mask is done here, I'm gonna actually zoom in a little bit more. That way, we can actually see exactly what's going on here with our vector scope. The reason that I use a draw mask and zoom in is that I find this way more accurate than using the show mask option when I'm trying to make tweaks to the skin tone. And primarily when we're focusing on a subject, we're gonna look at their face, so we want the skin tones to look good there. I will then go back to our hue saturation curve, and I'm gonna use this picker right here on the hue versus hue scale right here and I'm gonna use this to select the hue of his skin tone, and I recommend using the forehead in most situations when doing this. As you can see here, it made a red or orange hue for our skin tone value, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna take this, I'm gonna hold shift down and take this dot and move it where the yellow meets the green right here on this vertical line, and I'm actually gonna put another dot right there on that line for yellow. If we go back and take a look at our flesh line here, we can see that our skin tones are falling more towards the yellow side of the flesh line versus the right. So what we're going to do to fix this is we're going to hold shift down and take our first dot here, that is the hue value for our skin tone, and I'm going to raise that up until it's in the middle of that flesh line. Once you got the flesh line split right down the middle of our skin tone value, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this yellow now and I'm going to tighten up this value here. And you can do that by clicking on the yellow dot here, holding shift, and if you hold, pull up on it, you can see, if we look at our vector scope over here, how much tighter that looks than what it was before. Here is what it was before. I'm gonna click on the yellow now, and I'm gonna pull up on this until it's as tight as it possibly can. Now you can overdo this, for example, that's overdoing it right there. But I'm just gonna do this until it's as tight as it possibly can be. And I think right there is pretty darn good. So then what we can do is we can go back to this window here. We can uncheck our draw mask and we can back out of the transformation. And our skin tones are looking a lot better than what they were before. Here you can see that there is a very yellow tint or hue to our skin. Cine like D tends to do that a lot. And then when you try to adjust it, it makes it look like it's really red. So here's another quick tip to fix that. If we click our view mask here. You can see that we got a, it, it's pretty saturated in the skin right here after we moved it to the skin tone line. Or if we go here, we can see it's how far up as well. 
So to fix this, what I tend to do is I will actually go down to hue versus saturation and I will do the same thing where I'll select the skin tone hue and I'll actually just draw that down a little bit until it looks okay. And I typically find that this helps a lot with Cine like D. Let's see if I can uh, show you guys the difference here. So here's what it was before without desaturating the skin tone value. And that's what it looks like now. That might be a little too much, but just a little bit. It doesn't take much here. And you can see that difference already. So if we go, so if we go back to, here's what it was before. And that's where it is at now. And I think that makes a huge difference when shooting in Cine like D. I find that the skin tones get pretty wonky sometimes. And you can, you're definitely towards the yellow tint more on the vector scope of the flesh line. And then when you try to move it back, it gives you some really red or orange skin sometimes. So knowing that trick of pulling down the hue saturation curve right there helps out quite a bit. So let's jump to our next clip here. And this was shot in natural, so I'm just going to show you guys how to do it quickly with natural. The same rules apply, but you'll see that we don't really have to fight the skin tones as much. So I'm going to pull up our waveform. I'm going to hit Command-6. This one was exposed pretty darn nicely. You can see we're only a little bit overexposed, but nothing looks like it's clipping at all. And the shadows, I think I might not even mess with, to be honest. We have a black shirt, but I think we're hitting zero already as is. So... I'm going to pull the highlights down just a little under 100 to keep them protected. I'm going to pull the midtones down to just create that little contrast there more. Can you guys see that? So right there. And then we're going to pull up our vector scope here. And as you can see, it doesn't look like there's much saturation to the image. So we're going to bump this up. That's way too much. So we're going to just pull it down until it looks okay. I think right about there doesn't look too bad. And as you can see, we got to tighten up that skin tone right there. It's on the line and it's pretty darn close, but we got to clean that up a little bit. So I'm going to go to the hue saturation curve here and I'm going to create a color mask once again. I'm going to use the picker here with the HSL and isolate those skin tones with the mask there. Click view mask so we can see exactly what's going on. And right about there looks really good. Now, you could just go ahead and use the picker right here and get your skin tone value and make your adjustments, but you're also going to have the neck skin tones play into that as well, and I personally don't like doing that, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use the draw mask method that I just showed you before. So Command-5 to pull up the effect window. I'm going to type in draw on the search down here, drop it down here. I'm going to X out of this, hit Command-5 to close that. I'm going to turn off the view mask here quick and then I'm going to use draw mask here to draw a mask around my skin tones in my face here. And if we wanted to, we could zoom in here real quick. As you can see, look at the difference right here. You can see that it's kind of faint there, but when we really punch in, it kind of really just shows exactly what's going on a little bit more or better. And I like doing this because it just makes it easier to make the fine adjustments when needed. So right about there looks good. And then I'm going to go back to my hue saturation curve here. I'm going to use the picker on the hue versus hue again. Get my hue value for my forehead. And we're pretty darn close to yellow right here. So I'm just going to add one right here on the green. And then I'm just going to hold shift and move that one straight onto the yellow. You could use your arrows too like that. And honestly, you don't really have to move red or the orange hue up and down at all because it's pretty close to splitting that line as is. So what I'm going to do right away to tighten that up is I'm going to hold shift, pull our yellow value up here until it's as tight as it can be. And if you're having a hard time because the flesh line is kind of like getting in the way to see how tight your skin tone value is, you can actually pull it off the line a little bit. And then... As you can see, when I make my yellow adjustment now, it's super tight because here was here's how it was before, and now that's super tight. And then I'm going to pull it back on the line, but do note that you might have to make a change again once you get it back on the line because that value will change a little bit. But if we look on the yellow side of the flesh line here, when it's down lower, it's fatter, and when I put it up like that, I think 
it's its tightest value right about there. So now if we go back to this box here, and we uncheck the draw mask, click on that, this image is looking really great and we didn't really do much work to it. That was pretty quick to change. So I recommend that if you're dealing with skin tones that you shoot in natural, it just makes life a lot easier when you're trying to make those adjustments as you guys saw. But that doesn't mean that you can't get good looking images out of Cine Lake D as well. So what I just showed you guys here is how to get a good looking Rec 709 type image. But let's say you want to get a more creative look we can push the colors around even a little bit more. So what I like to do if I wanna do this is actually go back to here and I'm gonna create another color wheel. So it's gonna say color wheel two. And we're gonna create another color mask once again, just like we did for our hue versus saturation curve. We're gonna isolate the skin tones. This is probably the best we're gonna get it again. We do have that little issue here on his nose and with his hair, but that's really not gonna make that big of a difference. But what we're gonna do this time is you can see we have inside selected here. We're actually gonna go click the outside. We're gonna uncheck our mask here now. And we can take our master here and we can start moving the color around. And as you can see, this is affecting the overall tint or hue or the warmth or cool of the image but it's not affecting our skin tone. If we look right here, our skin tone on the vector scope here is staying the same regardless of how I move this master wheel around. So that's really nice because then we don't have to worry about dealing with our skin tones again. So if we want a cooler image, we could go and put it right here towards that teal. And naturally, with having it in teal, our skin tones are warmer, so you're gonna have that teal and orange look. And that's that's a really easy and quick way to do it. If you want your image to look a little, a little bit warmer, you can just easily move it towards the yellow or orange, and you can see already that it really warms up the image. Here's what it looked like before, and it just adds that slight warmth to it. We probably could push it a little bit more. You can see it adds warmth to that image there, but our skin tones, once again, are not affected at all. Now, if you wanted a more complex way of doing what I just showed you, you could actually go down here in the shadows and add teal and then orange to your highlights for that teal orange look. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like now. You know, you kind of get that look to it there. If you wanted to, you could also go in the shadows here and you could also put yellow into the shadows here and then put some green into the highlights and you kind of got that David Fincher look. You're going for that kind of look. That's a really easy way to do it. So here's what it looks like before. And now you can see that this is how this look works. It's a little bit warmer by putting yellow into the shadows. And if we look again at our view mask here, our skin tones aren't affected at all, which is really nice. That way we don't have to go into our midtones here and try to push this wheel around to get our skin tones to fall closer to that flesh line. Now, one thing I wanna make note of is if you're going for the teal and orange look sometimes, if like, let's say I do overall, I kinda of make it a little blue. One thing that you might run into sometimes when doing this is that your shadows are kinda of gonna get gross looking or they might have like some weird like artifacting going on cause it is the shadows they are gonna show noise more and such. So what you can do to fix that is if you go down to your hue saturation curves, we're going to create another one. So this is going to say hue saturation curves two. And if we go down to luma versus saturation, if we click right about here where the shadows begin, you can pull your sh the saturation down in the shadows here. And you don't have to be so crazy with it. You don't have to go this far. A lot of times, like right here, I call acceptable or I do this a lot because I still want that tint in the shadows. But if you go like this here, and we turn this on and off, you can see how we had that blue tint right here. But when I turn this on, it's more just black or dark. So that really kind of helps with the artifacting and the noise or that gross look when you try to really push the colors quite a bit. And that's how I color graded my footage. It may seem like a lot at first, but after doing it a few times, you will catch on for sure. And once again, I am not a colorist by any stretch of the imagination. so. 
You'll just have to play around and see what works best for you. This is just what works best for me. And I'm hoping that this helps you out. So that's going to do it for this video here. I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. If you like this video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below. Subscribe if you haven't already and make sure you hit the bell. That way you get notified when I drop future videos just like this one here. And last but not least, I will catch you guys in the next video.